the common modalities of governance, for Hello, Smari. Hello, Marvin. Um, so may maybe we can start this interview with a short presentation of who you are, so that the audience can know. Okay. Um, so I'm Smari McCarthy. I work with the International Modern Media Institute in Iceland. I've also been involved with various uh, projects over the last years for both industrial infrastructure and um, uh, increasingly democracy. Uh, so direct democracy, liquidity, and, and so on. So, yeah. thank you. Marvin? I'm Marvin Brown. I live in Berkeley, California, and I've been working in the area of ethics and economics, and I'm now working more on the notion of a global citizen. Thank you. Uh, Smari, I would like you to tell me a bit about your activities with the uh, IMI mm -hmm. and, uh, and event eventually other activities uh, that are centered around democracy. And so, what I would like to know is what do you think is missing today uh, in the current systems and how is your activity related in actually solving some of these issues? Right. So uh, we started in May in uh, late 2009 with the goal of trying to gather together the best media laws and best uh, laws about information flow from various countries around the world and try to implement them all in one place, uh, namely Iceland. And around that we built up the idea that uh, we could do a kind of inverse tax haven, that uh, the same way as tax havens uh, protect opaqueness and, and hide uh, information which should be transparent, we would make a transparency haven of sorts and uh, allow everybody to see all of the information that's relevant to them. Uh, of course, uh, then we took it into an international context which was that there are more countries in Iceland that should be adopting this kind of law and actually getting laws passed in a country takes a long time. So here we are uh, three and a half years down the road and we've managed to get a couple of laws through. We've uh, participated a lot in the um, process of making a new constitution in Iceland which uh, took up a lot of time, a lot of effort and, and uh, uh, we got some very, very good things into the new constitution, but then it was scrapped at the end of the last uh, parliamentary session. Uh, now we might get it reintroduced, but we, we might not. But in all of this, uh, there's only so much pushing you can do in any given time frame. So uh, when we're not dealing with the issues in Iceland, we're running around the world trying to solve problems in various European countries, in, in the Middle East and North Africa, especially after the uh, Arab Spring started, uh, to some degree in North America and, and just wherever there is a calling for, uh, for this kind of um, rehashing of the idea of what free speech and, and information regulation is. So, so what I want to know specifically is what do you think is wrong with the current form of democracy and what kind of solutions do you think that, that we need and then maybe you end with uh, the relationship with the commons. How is there a relationship between democracy and commons? So the biggest problem with democracy at the moment is that it was never really fully implemented. Uh, there was this idea that came up around the Enlightenment era that we could implement a, uh, a system of uh, governance by the people. And then, instead of going the, the full way, uh, we, we just stopped short of it by, by creating these representative democracies. Only now we've come to this kind of uh, post-representative society, where we have representatives of representatives running around representing each other and not us. And that's pretty horrible. So what we can actually do about it is we can start to take the best elements of, uh, of representative democracy, which are uh, that people don't necessarily have to be involved personally with every single issue, and that uh, they can delegate their, their authority to uh, trusted third parties, uh, and mix it in with the best elements of direct democracy, namely that you can participate whenever you want, you can, uh, you can have a voice in any issue. And uh, in combining these, we get this idea that's been called uh, liquid democracy or, or democratic liquidity, 
where much in the same way as we, we try to increase liquidity in the monetary system by giving, uh, having more money, we try to increase liquidity in the democratic system by having more votes, by allowing people to have more granular control over their society. And technically this might not have been feasible 200 years ago, but now with the internet and with uh, all sorts of communication technologies, we can, we can actually do this. We can make uh, everybody have a voice in whichever issues they want, and they can choose to not participate whenever they want. So that's kind of the broad pipeline, the, the broad kind of direction we need to go. But on the other hand, getting there is slightly more tricky. We need to build the software, we need to build the, uh, the uh, have the discussions, uh, build the discursive networks, and you know, over time just build up trust for this idea. Uh, because we, only when we've, when we've kind of gotten people to buy into the idea of, of having a voice in every issue can we actually get to that point. And before we can actually even start doing that, we need to first make sure that people have information about the issues. Because <clears throat> in the same way as it's really damaging when, when people uh, don't get to make decisions, it's really damaging when people uh, make decisions without having the prerequisite information. So opening up better transparency, more, uh, more freedom of expression and so on is the kind of first fundamental step we need to do in order to make all of the transition steps of uh, allowing people to participate more make sense later on. So uh, as for the commons, um, all this connects into the commons basically on the field of we cannot build a, uh, a participatory democracy without there being uh, access to common goods, common knowledge, common uh, awareness, and, and specifically uh, common decision-making systems. So uh, all of this comes back to the commons one way or another all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marvin, I would like you to talk about your book, uh, Civilizing the Economy, mm -hmm. which um, I'll summarize my interpretation of it, which is basically going from an economy and democracy based on, mem on property to one based on membership. So mm -hmm. can you maybe outline the important thesis of your work? Sure. Yeah, I, th I mean, in 1776, when there was the American Revolution, right, the only people that could be participate in the democracy were property owners, male property owners. Uh, and that whole tradition was really the development of um, early Smithian economics that was based on an economics of property. Um, and so when we treat and continue to treat human beings and, and the planet as commodities, uh, we're just moving into an unsustainable future. Uh, so we need an, an alternative. And the alternative I proposed was um, to look at economics from a civic perspective and actually to take on the position of participating in the civic. And that totally changes <clears throat> the purpose of the economy because instead of the accumulation of property, the purpose of the economy becomes the making of provisions. So how do we provide for one another? Um, and we have to make decisions about doing that. So how do we as citizens make those decisions to design an economy that actually provides for one another. And so a large part of um, the work and the teaching and the writing I do is about um, a civic identity. What that means in the workplace is that people should not leave their civic rights, their human rights when they go to work, but actually be treated as citizens and practice a kind of workplace democracy so that they have a say in the design of their workplaces. They have a say in the distribution of profit, um, that all these become part of um, uh, decisions that are made by everyone involved in, in whatever the business is. Yeah, I, I, of course, I, I think the, an obvious question is then, um, you know, the workers go to work, but they don't own the factory. So why would, uh, why would the owners of the factories allow the workers to have these rights. And so my question is, how do you go from the existing situation to your alternative? 
Yeah, well, I think you, <clears throat> you have to go through politics and governments. Um, that corporations are creations of the state and they're legal entities. And um, the way in the United States and most places they're created is they're created as properties that people can buy and sell them. Um, and there are movements now in the United States to develop new charters for corporations. And that's one of the things we need to do. Um, we can also, um, through the political system, certainly uh, develop living wages. For example, in San Francisco, where I live, uh, anyone working in San Francisco, um, that business has to pay a living wage, right? So there's ways in which you can work to um, protect the civic rights of, of workers. Another part of it, I think, though, is um, there's kind of a history of the, the struggle for the civic. So in the United States, I mean, after the Civil War, African Americans could vote for the first time. Women got the right to vote in the 1920s. Um, workers got the right to organize, some civic rights in the 1930s. You have the Civil Rights Movement. So there's a civic history moving toward inclusion and respect. And I think we can ground what we're trying to do now in that civic history and, and continue it. Have you thought about the connection between, you focus on citizenship and civil society mm -hmm. and this re-emergent of the notion of the commons. Is, do, how do you see the, related, the relationship between civil society and the commons? Well, the relationship I've developed is um, the notion of a common humanity, that, um, which means we're members of the planet, of the living system, we're members, we're animals in the animal kingdom. Um, there's this common humanity. <clears throat> but I think also what I've learned is there's this option or choice to treat things as commons and instead of as property. And in a way, in my book, I talk about that as property or provision, but it's very close to saying these are common resources and they should be available to all. Um, so there's a lot of overlap, I think, between an economics of provision and um, kind of current conversations about the commons. Okay. So maybe a last question is, what gives you most hope today? Uh, and especially related to the, the commons movement? Well, hope is hard, <laughs> hard to come by. But, uh, I mean, I think it is this civic tradition of struggle. So now, I mean, one of the main organizations in the United States is 350.org, and they're trying to protect the environment, they're trying to prevent the Keystone Pipeline. Um, thousands of people are coming out um, joining in these protests. Um, at one time they circled the White House <laughs> um, to try to persuade President Obama not to approve this. So we have citizens actions groups <clears throat> that um, are, are moving in that direction. <clears throat> we have politicians, um, particularly on the local level, on the city level, that I think uh, are showing that there's hope to bring about change and, and to protect people, so. Uh. I'm sorry, um, so first of all, what gives you hope? And the second question that would be, um, you know, the proposal by Marvin is a bit in economics of the commons, in economics of civil society, so maybe what is your reaction on, on these ideas? Well, so, the most hopeful thing at the moment is the availability of information has grown very, very massively. And there's not really any, uh, any fundamental like uh, structural limitations anymore that are preventing people from knowing what's happening in society and uh, learning how to, how to change it and how to interact with it in, in a much deeper way than before. I think that's great. Um, what we, uh, on the flip side of that, there's a, a slight worry, which is that um, uh, while this, uh, this potential is now being unlocked by, by new technologies, uh, bad laws, bad policies, bad, uh, 
uh, bad ideas about how uh, how to make knowledge enclosures and how to lock up and, and hide away the knowledge uh, are, are coming about with uh, new types of in intellectual monopolies and so on. So uh, while we have this new hope, we need to be very vigilant about how we protect it. Uh, so uh, as to Marvin's idea, um, I, I generally like this, uh, this idea. It's um, it's uh, kind of slightly subversive uh, in, a, in a fun <laughs> way. Um, the the thing that worries me about it is the use of the term provision, uh, which uh, might just be like a term that you chose, but uh, but it kind of implies that there's some somebody who, uh, from the outside providing, whereas uh, really what this should be is a kind of commonality of everybody participating in the in the common provision. And that's just kind of a meaning mm -hmm. issue. And of course, if you mean it to be like a common thing, then, then fine. Uh, but there's, there's this, um, this tendency to think of the state and the people as two separate entities. And they are two separate entities in most cases. But there is room for overlap. There's a potential for the state and the people uh, being the same and, and undis indistinguishable from each other. And uh, so when people are talking about the public sector, private sector, what they're talking about is the maintenance of this distinction, where what our goal should be is to eliminate the distinction and have everything uh, collapse down into, into the commons, right? So no more right wing, no more left wing, no more individualism or socialism, but rather networks of decentralized authority and decentralized decision-making capacity that uh, allows us to all work together on the common provision of, of what we need, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I, um, in civilizing the economy, the reason for the notion of provision really is, um, or the, yeah, the reason for the notion of provision is that we continue in the United States, in the West, I think, to ignore who's providing us our food, our clothing, etc. right? And so the story of the United States is, in fact, the, um, the invisibility of slavery, which provided most of the wealth of early capitalism. Mm -hmm. Or when, um, you know, the invisibility of women or the invisibility of other people uh, who are providing us things, yep. that these are providers. And so, um, you know, in Adam Smith and that tradition, land, labor, and money are seen as commodities. Yep. And I want to see them as providers. So what does land provide us and how are we stewards of land as a provision? I, I could use the lang language of commons as well. But there is this transformation, I think, of moving that we as providers take common provisions, transform them into a nice dinner, <laughs> into a good yep. movie. and. And these are providers, and I want these providers to be recognized and respected. 